I'm going to leave the timer here. Like. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, Nicole just spoke there about being outside your comfort zone, and I can tell you that I pretty much am. I, I feel like I should put on a Shakespeare play. It's such a magnificent theatre. So if I'm a bit shaky, that's why. Um, and if I refer to my notes, it's because I have a terrible memory. So if you bear with me, I hope my talk is a journey that will um, inspire you. I think um, that what was said was that I run a, an innovation agency called the Department of Change. Um, didn't understand, but I think that's what he said. Um, and uh, you might think that the Department of Change sounds a bit like a government department. I like to think of it as a department of the people. Um, and you'll see shortly why um, I called the agency that. And it kind of um, epitomizes sort of um, the approach that I want to share with you today. Um, the most important uh, sort of thinking behind it is that I had been in agencies uh, for all my career um, and I wanted to stop having my, the work that we do framed by what. Agencies define themselves by what they make, whether it's digital or direct marketing or TV. And um, it, in keeping with something Johnny said earlier, I wanted to move to who do we work for, um, and in this case, obviously customers, people, ordinary, everyday, hardworking people out there, um, and also why. Um, and I guess I was inspired by the idea of transforming the value of businesses by transforming the value that they um, deliver for customers. So, um, with that, I promised today to share um, a manifesto that kind of summarizes um, the, the work um, ethic, the work principles that I wanted to share. Um, but before I, I, I read you that, I'm just going to give you a little bit of the story of the making of that, of that manifesto. So, I'm going to take you through uh, five projects, a little bit in depth, um, because for me, the how they happened um, and who they were for and uh, why we did them is, is quite crucial. Okay, so there are some pictures you might not have expected to see. Um, I don't know how much you know here about South Africa, a country called South Africa, at the very bottom tip of Africa. Um, and for many, many years, um, what most people thought about when they thought about South Africa was apartheid. Um, or apart hate, which is probably more uh, true to, to, to what it was. Um, it was a country in need of transformation. Now, I, I was born in um, the middle of Africa, in a country then called Rhodesia. I moved to South Africa, and I was educated in South Africa. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a country where four million white people ruled over 30 million black people. Um, whites thought they were supreme, and black people were oppressed. Um, and that's where I went to school. Um, and I had a very difficult position because I had um, a white mother um, and a called non-white father. So I could see life from both sides, and I never really fitted in, which is actually a good thing in retrospect. Let's take you back to 1983. Um, I was 15, and I was at a white-only school. Um, and we had to write a paper, a very deep, long paper. Um, and we could pick any nice subject in our nice history textbooks and write a paper um, on that subject. And we had almost a year to deliver this magnum opus. And I looked through the history textbooks to find a subject that I could work on for that length of time. It would have to be really, you know, an ex a subject that, 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 that sort of provoked or, you know, stimulated, inspired. Um, and I found one line about something called the Sharpville Riots. You can see it there, the Sharpville Riots. And all it said in my textbook was that a crowd of black people protested outside of a white police station and four white police officers were afraid and they opened fire, killing 69 people and hurting a lot of others. That's what I read in a, in a sentence. I looked for more information, there wasn't any. I went to the school library, there wasn't any. I went to the town library, there wasn't any. I couldn't find out anything else about this. And so I decided this would have to be my project. And I went out to the people. I interviewed old people. 
I interviewed young people, I got them to talk to the people that they knew. And slowly but surely, over the couple of months, I started to get interviews on, in those days, cassette tape, those of you who are old enough to remember those. Um, I got people bringing me old, frayed, yellowed newspaper cuttings of the times. I got them to draw their memories um, and write down what they, what they could uh, recall. And slowly but surely, I had this wealth of, of material, but I didn't know how to actually write a paper because it wasn't the same kind of research um, that probably they thought we should be doing it um, for the project. And so I went to what you might have called technology back then. Um, it's called a carousel. And what it allowed me to do is on the side, there's a cassette tape, and I could narrate the script, the story of the Sharpeville riots, and I could embed into it the interviews that I'd collected with real live voices. And then that was synchronized with the slides at the top. So when you pushed play, you got the story, and it synchronized the slides in the screen. And that whole thing was a dedicated machine for that. Um, I did it, I submitted it, everyone else submitted their papers, we waited a couple of months for it to, to come back to us, um, and when it did, I got an A+, plus, but I didn't have my project back. Everyone else took their papers, I left empty-handed. So my parents sat me down and they gave me a grave warning that I must not continue in this manner. Of course, it was encouragement to me. And from that, I think I bring this up because for me, it's a crucible in which I developed probably the approach I've taken through my career to marketing. Um, it was about transformation. It was about transformation of a conscience, uh, transformation of a culture. It was yearning to transform a government. It involved real people. It involved storytelling to reveal truths and it captured authentic experiences, but in a compelling way that could create real change. The trouble is it had its limitations, because that technology meant it wasn't in real time, it couldn't be distributed, I couldn't create community around it and get a movement, um, and it could be shut down, and so it was. But in there were the principles. So we're going to skip forward shortly. Um, I had a brief spell in journalism, for those of you who I know are in the room who are in publishing, um, but journalism in South Africa meant watching people getting beaten and watching people tear gassed. I looked white, so I was never thrown into the truck with all the, the black people, um, and I just couldn't live with that role in that country at that time. And so I did what you might think was a cop-out. I joined an advertising agency, at the time McCann Erickson. Um, and actually what I discovered was the power of brands, that brands can be a huge catalyst to create change, a catalyst of transformation. Um, and what was important about that in that country, and, and you know, there, are, there are some resonances between that time and, and now in our modern world, um, in the, in, in, um, certainly in, in Britain and the US. It was a time when no religion held the country together, no government held the country together. There were 11 languages in South Africa, so no language helped, held people together. Um, no schools, buses, churches, nobody used the same things. Everybody was divided by, in, in everything they did. But brands, like sport, brands could if they could create meaningful messages, if they could align themselves with the aspiration that crossed all those divides, then brands could bring people together. Um, and there was a, there I was, a junior copywriter, and I got a brief for this brand, you can see in the bottle, Bertram's VO. It was a brandy. Um, it's no, it's, its competitors in the rest of the world might be brands like Martel VO, much better known. And this influx of competitive overseas brands came into the country. And the client came in and said, this is just a local, a local brand. There's nothing really differentiating it. How can we make it the local people's local choice? Um, we really don't have a lot to work with. Um, and they wanted to run a competition. They had this idea for a competition, kind of like a sales promotion, I guess, in which people were invited, you'd be invited 
to um, either send in instruments and record it on cassette tape and submit that as your competition entry. They would choose five winners who were, who were best, um, and what you'd win is the chance to do a three-day workshop with a star. Now, when you're in Africa, um, at the bottom end of Africa, to have a star come over from the US or Europe and be in a three-day workshop with that person and then form the backup band for them on stage in Swaziland, that's your dream. So it was a great idea for a competition. And our brief was simply, could we come up with something that the agent, the rep who would go and see musicians' agents all over Europe and the States, could we come up with something he could leave behind? So if I left it with you, the hope is it would be compelling enough for you to give to the famous star. What could that be? They said, we're from Africa. Don't make it look African. Make it glitzy. Make it glamorous. Um, it needs to be glossy. It needs to stand up against all that stuff in Europe and, and the States. Um, but we didn't do that. We went out into the streets. Um, in, the, in the method that I had learned, I went and look, visited aspiring musicians. We, we met them in shabines, which are beer houses. We saw them in the streets. Um, we, we just toured all over uh, Cape Town. And as you can see in the picture over there, we discovered something incredible that the client didn't even know. The brand had come in a tin. At the premium end, it came in a tin. And what youngsters did is they cut a hole in the middle of the tin, they strung it up, and they put the, the, the wooden plinth in, and they made string guitars, and they played them. And they played them incredibly. Um, and here you had an idea coming straight out of the brand. And so we paid um, aspiring musicians to make us, to hand make us a hundred of those. And everything that's there was handmade by local artisans. It's made of corrugated board. It's made of, the brochures held together with curtain rings. Um, so it really did resonate, kind of made in Africa by hand. And the story of it was, come to Africa and take these kids from a tin guitar to an electric guitar. And it sold the dream. Um, and actually, it shows you how long ago it was. Um, but we had responses from Tina Turner, Mariah Carey, um, a guy most people forget now called Billy Ocean, but Eric Clapton. And actually, it was Eric Clapton who came out and he did the gig. Um, it was such an honor. Um, but again, you can see that from this method of, of real stories, uh, with real people, um, with authentic, um, authentic uh, props from life stories. We didn't just transform the brand, we transformed those kids' lives. And actually, for, for the thousands who went to the concert in Swaziland, which is next to South Africa, because musicians couldn't visit South Africa because of embargoes, it was a weekend that transformed our consciousness too, and we could step outside of apartheid. So soon after that, um, it won a number of awards. My family had moved to Britain, and I thought, well, I've got a couple of awards. I wonder if I can, can make it in Britain. Um, I arrived with my kind of people-centered approach, um, handmade approach to advertising, um, and, and I wondered how it would work. Well, of course, when I got there, it didn't really work. Um, it was the time of a real era of traditional advertising um, in the late 90s. Um, TV was king. Um, I went into direct marketing and I learned a lot about one-to-one -one marketing, which I felt more comfortable in, actually. Um, but then the digital revolution came and social media happened. And suddenly, my word of mouth machine that I loved, that I could use, that I felt so comfortable with, th this was like word of mouth on acid. Um, and, so, and so I got a brief. Um, sitting in my office as a kind of middleweight copywriter um, for a charity called the, the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. Now, I'm going to play you the film so that you, you understand um, the story. Um, but, in essence, there had been some research to say, look, the people who donate to this charity, a lot of charities have this problem, they're older. Actually, in this case, they're over 70. And it's the least known charity among young people in the country. The trustees of the charity were worried. Could they make themselves relevant to young people? 
they put a very small budget together and they said, run some research that shows us whether we can, there, there's validity to doing a campaign um, for young people. And I thought, you know, a campaign is not the answer. We could do beautiful ads about the 500 under 25 year olds who actually work for the RNLI. They risk their lives every day to save the lives of other, others at sea. But kids aren't gonna read those ads. They're not going to believe those ads. They're not going to be interested in those ads. We needed to find a different way. We needed to align this brand with something that the youth, um, as they were called back then, um, aspired to. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution was facing an unexpected crisis. The vast majority of their supporters won't be around forever. So how could the RNLI get tomorrow's supporters interested in a charity? A charity that research showed was the least known amongst the youth in Britain. RNLI became the hottest topic around with 15 to 20 year olds. How did the RNLI become so relevant to their lives? By seeking a higher purpose than sea rescue. Research showed that among the youth's top three concerns was the way the media stereotypes them as a lost generation. Dumbed down, game numbed, knife wielding, without values, vision or views. Who better to champion them than a brand that has 470 volunteers between the ages of 17 and 22 who risk their lives at sea to save others. But how could this youth audience be reached? Social networking really brings them together, but was there a way in? After finding YouTube's 12 most popular video bloggers, direct marketing was used to enter their world with subversive, unbranded mystery packages, which got closer to them than most brands ever do. One of the bloggers mentioned online he was doing a gig, so a guy dressed up as a courier went to the venue to deliver his package. When another blogger mentioned his drama school, a mystery package was dropped there. One address was discovered by buying a belt off the blogger on eBay. But because it was done with a sense of honesty, the bloggers took on the challenge. Rewrite the headlines about your generation. The RNLI fueled the debate and a generation responded because they were given a cause, themselves. The intrigue built, they became obsessed about who was behind the packages. What is going on with mystery package people? I think that they seem to be the good intention people. The RNLI responded by inviting the bloggers to visit RNLI HQ with their cameras to find out for themselves. Now, the youth who'd never heard of the RNLI were using their own media to talk about them. First thing we got to do on the Saturday morning was see a capsizing lifeboat exercise. And then in the afternoon we went out on a big lifeboat out to sea. What started as a campaign became a movement. Like, it makes me want to be part of it, and that's what we're doing way back today. So, Direct was taken to new levels. Their addresses weren't bought, they were discovered. They read letters, but not to themselves, instead to a million others. Individual packs were personalized like never before. What's more, tactile media was launched into cyberspace. Honestly though guys, this hoodie is so soft, it's so nice. Yeah, I'm absolutely astounded. I can't believe someone like, thought to sent me a hoodie and that message was so nice. All this got almost one million responses, comments, videos and views. The campaign was featured twice by YouTube's editors and was number one most viewed in the UK, France, Switzerland, Russia, Australia and Canada. The RNLI reached 11% of 15 to 20 year olds in Britain for little more than the cost of 12 handmade mail packs, which rebranded not only the RNLI, but also the youth, their supporters of tomorrow. Thank you. Um, I'm under strict instructions to get you to lunch, so I'm going to skip my next um, example and I'm going to go straight into something a lot more recent. Um, as it happens, not long after that campaign, um, I left uh, the VBDO agency. I'd been there 16 years since, since coming here. Um, and I decided uh, that it was time to open my own place. Um, 
so that I could be free of having to always create campaigns because I had such a passion about the fact that people could play um, an, an even bigger role, not only in helping brands create advertising, um, but also products and services. And I wanted to experiment with that and I kept getting into trouble um, at the agency. Um, and so I opened Department of Change and, and maybe sometimes I smile to myself um, because it's, it's a little bit of my rebellion against the Department of Education who confiscated my project um, so long ago. Um, but in the Department of Change, we very soon got a brief from a brand called Experian. Now, some of you who know Experian know that they do credit scoring for consumers and businesses. They wanted to diversify and they wanted to create a product called um, Identity Protect. Um, they wanted to get into helping uh, people avoid fraud online but they'd had a string of product failures. So here was our chance. They wanted us to develop a customer-centered um, approach to designing products. This was new territory for us and very exciting. Um, but my, the, the question I had going in was how could Experian not just create a, an identity fraud product? How could they not just sell an identity fraud product, but how could they align their brand with something that people aspired to? Because after all, in Britain, people didn't want to think about online fraud, never mind talk about it. They didn't know what identity really meant online. Um, and they didn't understand the product. So this is what we did. Over 4 million people in Britain have woken up to find someone pretending to be them. They believed that keeping safe online was someone else's problem. But with fraudsters using sophisticated programs called bots, they'd become victims of identity fraud. We decided we couldn't stand by and let this happen. So, we asked ourselves, if fraudsters have their bots, isn't it about time we had ours? We took this radical idea out onto the streets of Britain to ask people what they thought of having their very own digital guardian. They loved it, and they made it their own. So, the idea of an ID bot was born. Experian may have created it, but it belonged to the people. Right from the beginning, this was a project with people at its heart. With the first version of the bot in the market, we set about getting customers, prospects and the Experian team together to build an even better bot. One that wouldn't just protect people's identity, but also police, prove and promote it. We set up an innovation hothouse, a place to ideate and prototype quickly during the day, then get customer feedback overnight. Then we invited in industry experts. And they told us how much people's bad habits were contributing to the problem. We realized we had to do more than just make a smart product. We also had to help people change their behavior. So we opened up to thousands of people all over Britain on Facebook. And we became the People's ID Bot Project. In real time, we mined rich insights about our audience, leveraged news stories like Heartbleed to drive engagement, performed live trials of Identity Protect, and even began to help people understand how they're putting themselves at risk. The results? In just two months, we had delivered 50 new service ideas, 50 new prototypes, tested by a thousand people, over 11,000 people engaged in our customer community, and a video that was seen over 230,000 times around the world, and shared the same front page as Kim Kardashian's wedding pics. All along with tons of valuable in-market learnings as we work together to shape the ID bot of the future. So what became exciting there is we were doing everything in one pass. We were doing the research to get insights. We were developing the creative out of real material. We were doing product design on the, on the trot. 
and we were building a community, in that case of 11,000 people who still belong to this community today, helping Experian create, uh, create products. So I promised you that I would read you um, my manifesto, and I captured it um, on the way here, so forgive me if I, if I read it. It's aimed mainly at agencies and at clients, um, but publishers, I'm sure you'll see yourselves in, in here too. Customers, donors, players, diners, guests, investors, employees, partners, patrons, readers, viewers, users, shoppers, students, patients, bosses, drinkers, gardeners, DIYers, borrowers, savers, retirees, and citizens. They wield influence. They vote with their feet. They can make or break a brand, a company, a president. In, less, in 140 characters, fewer than five stars, or just one unsmiley. They have the media in their hands and they're raising their voices against intrusive advertising, poor products, inadequate services, and exploitative businesses. They're no longer content with being passive consumers of what is considered by businesses to be good enough, or even good for them. They want to have a conversation with the brands they choose. They want to get involved in the making of the products, services, and experiences that they pay for. And they want to have a say about whether they pay for them with their money, their time, their data, or their influence. More than anything, they want to do business with businesses who know that the only good profit comes from making the world around them richer too. For them, a new model agency needs to be born. An agency that understands that digital isn't a department, a project, a job title, but can make the impossible possible in everything, everywhere, for everyone. An agency that is not in the business of communication, but of transformation. One that knows that transformation isn't about technology, but uses technology to transform business, society, government, the economy, the cities, our countrysides, our world. An agency that goes beyond advertising to invent products, services, experiences, and, and spaces that make more people happier more of the time. One that doesn't need big budgets, doesn't need to belong to big networks, doesn't need big names above the door, doesn't even need to be in the big capitals of the world, but knows that greatness can come from doing small things differently, simply, smartly, and with a conscience every day. Frankly, a new model agency is one that doesn't work for its clients, but for the people its clients serve. And if you're a client out there, then we hope that's good news. Because you should be working for the people your business serves too. So that means from now on, we're all on the same side. But it also means, as new model agencies, that there are a few things we'll do differently. We won't say what you want to hear, if it isn't what your customer needs. We'll let you know if you're being pressured to do by your bosses and your shareholders what will disappoint or compromise your customer. We'll involve you as we answer the brief, but we'll also involve the people you serve, your staff, your customers, and those who would be your customers, if only. We'll always remember that your customer's data is their identity, their life, their possession, and the only good use of it is for their good, not just yours. We won't invent new technology-driven solutions for your customers without also remembering that it comes with a responsibility for helping them change their behavior too. The bottom line, we'll never deliver an idea to market that makes your business a profit if it isn't also useful and valuable for your customer, or if it's at the expense of the world. If you're that brave new client, you'll find in this magnificent theatre today new model agencies who will dedicate their every day and very often nights to harnessing storytelling, design, data and technology to co-create and make real ideas that do three things. Change your business, change your customers' lives, and change the world, or at least our corner of it, for good. Thank you very much. Let's